headlines, a South Korean President Park Geun-hye and her visiting Chinese counterpart the Xi Jinping hold summit talks in Seoul and express a resolute opposition to North Korea's nuclear weapons development. The two countries also promised efforts to finalize the Korea-China free trade negotiations by the year's end. Meanwhile, two other players in this region are closing up as well. Japan has decided to ease some sanctions on North Korea in return for a reopening of a probe into Japanese abductees. Hello and welcome to Primetime News. I'm Sean Lim. And I'm Kang Tiri. Thanks for joining us tonight. President Park Geun-hye and visiting Chinese President Xi Jinping held talks in Seoul on this Thursday, where the two leaders reaffirmed a commitment to their strategic cooperative partnership and shared their positions on North Korea's nuclear program. They did not, however, specifically mention Tokyo's recent historical denials during their joint news conference. Our Che Yusun has more. President Park and Xi's message for North Korea Thursday was certainly a step up from last year's use of the phrase grave threat regarding the North's nuclear program. Emphasizing that the denuclearization of North Korea should be achieved through the now suspended six party talks involving the two Koreas, President Park and Chi added that the right conditions must be met before reviving the dialogue. This reflects Seoul's position that Pyongyang first needs to show its commitment to denuclearize. The Chinese leader also positively assessed President Park's policy of trust building and having more humanitarian exchanges with North Korea. 우리 두 정상은 한반도 신뢰 프로세스가 남북한 간 신뢰를 형성함으로써 남북 관계를 발전시키고 한반도의 지속 가능한 평화 정착에 도움이 된다는 점을 다시 한번 확인하였습니다. As for Seoul-Beijing ties, the two leaders assessed their strategic cooperative partnership and agreed to take it to the next level by holding regular political and security meetings and increasing people-to-people -people exchanges. On the economic front, President Park and Xi agreed to work toward concluding their free trade negotiations by the year's end and to open their currency trade markets to spur bilateral trade and investments. Attention now shifts to how Pyongyang will react to Seoul and Beijing's firm opposition to its nuclear ambitions. While very cautious to criticize its traditional ally, experts suggest that North Korea may turn away from China for now and focus on improving ties with Japan and Russia. Choi Yusan, Arirang News. Well, North Korea wasn't the only talking point for Presidents Park and Xi during their summit talks. That's right. Economic matters were also high on the agenda, and uh, both leaders came to a number of agreements that stand to strengthen bilateral business ties. Our Hwang Song Yi reports. President Park Geun-hye and Chinese President Xi Jinping agreed Thursday to speed up bilateral free trade talks so they can strike a deal by the end of this year. Negotiations date back to 2012, but the two countries are at odds over removing tariffs on sensitive items. Agricultural and fishery products for Seoul and petrochemicals, steel and machinery goods for Beijing. If and when it goes into effect, the deal is expected to boost trade between the two countries, which stood at 230 billion U.S. dollars last year. We set a goal of reaching a bilateral trade volume of $300 billion by 2015 and agreed to provide improved conditions. Presidents Park and Xi also agreed to allow direct transaction of their local currencies as early as possible. Only 1 percent of Korean companies with enough yuan can currently settle their trading bills with Chinese partners in the Chinese currency. But once the deal takes into effect, there will be no need to convert it into the U.S. dollar. 이번 시 주석님 방한 계기에 원 위안화 직거래 시장 개설, 한국 내 위안화 청산 결제 은행 지정, 그리고 위안화 적격 해외 기관 투자자 자격 부여 등 
양국 간 금융 인프라 구축에 큰 성과를 이룬 것을 기쁘게 생각합니다. Direct one yuan trading is expected to help internationalize the Chinese currency and cut Korean traders' business costs with China by at least 3 to 5 percent. Hang Sang-hee, Arirang News. Now, before sitting down with uh, President Park uh, today, Chinese President Xi offered his thoughts on this uh, summit in a piece that uh, appeared in Korea's major dailies on this morning. It encouraged greater cooperation between Seoul and Beijing and expressed high hopes for the summit. Our Yulian has more. Chinese President Xi Jinping begins his piece with a traditional Korean saying, it only costs three straw bags to buy a house, but a thousand to get a good neighbor, emphasizing the importance of having good neighbors. He goes on to say that Seoul and Beijing have been able to build a healthy relationship based on trust, adding the two should always be able to freely exchange opinions on areas of mutual interest. President Xi also calls economic cooperation the main focal point of Korea-China relations and says China is aiming to expand its economic ties with Seoul through speedy negotiations on their bilateral FTA. As for his visit to Seoul, he writes that he hopes the two leaders will share a friendship, discuss cooperation and preserve peace. His words were echoed a day earlier by Korean President Park Geun-hye during an interview with China CCTV, where she expressed hope that the visit will bring relations between the two to a new high. When asked about Korea's ongoing historical disputes with Japan, President Park simply said Tokyo needs to have a correct understanding of history. She also accused Tokyo of trying to undermine the 1993 Kono Statement, which was its official apology for forcing roughly 200,000 women into sexual slavery during World War II. 신뢰를 저버리는 일이고 또 국제 사회의 그 준엄한 그런 그 어떤 목소리에 목소리를 무시하는 그런 행위라고 생각을 합니다. 그래서 일본은 이제라도 어떻게 역사의 수레바퀴를 되돌릴 수는 도저히 없는 것이기 때문에 Japan's recent attempts to revise history and economic cooperation between China and Korea will top the agenda of the summit between the two leaders. Yurian, Arirang News. The media spotlight is not just on President Xi, but also his wife, who is accompanying him on his trip to Seoul. She's almost as well known as her husband, and her fashion style in particular has made headlines around the world. And our Song Ji san has more on China's First Lady. She is the Michelle Obama of the world's second largest economy and has been referred to as the Carla Bruni of China for her past career in entertainment. It's Chinese First Lady Peng Li Yuan, who was once more famous than her husband for her regular appearances in an annual CCTV New Year's Gala. Unlike her predecessors, the former singer and performer has been outgoing and active in her role as China's First Lady. The world's 57th most powerful woman, according to Forbes magazine, is also a goodwill ambassador for the World Health Organization. Selected to the international best dress by Vanity Fair magazine last year, everything Peng wears makes headlines in fashion magazines and immediately sells out. Peng is scheduled to visit palaces in the Korean capital and attend cultural events during her two-day visit and will be on her own for most of our itinerary while her husband holds talks. To show around the city, the presidential office of Chongwa Day has tapped current senior secretary for political affairs Cho Yun Sun, who will serve as Punk's personal tour guide during her stay. Song Ji Sun, Arirang News. Meanwhile, the other two major players in Northeast Asia are cozying up on their own. Japan and North Korea are moving along with their recent agreement to reopen their probe on Japanese abductees in return for lifting some of the sanctions on North Korea. Connelly has more. Following months of government-level talks and an agreement made back in May, Japan will ease some sanctions on North Korea. This in return for Pyongyang's commitment to reinvestigate the abductions of Japanese citizens in the 1970s and 80s. 
Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe did not elaborate on which sanctions will be lifted, but told reporters on Thursday that this was merely the beginning of more things to come. Under the principle of action being repaid with action, I want to lift part of the sanctions Japan has imposed. However, this is just a start. But bilateral sanctions that Japan could be lifting include travel bans to and from Pyongyang, restrictions on how much money can be sent or brought into the communist state, and port calls by North Korean ships to Japan. In 2002, North Korea admitted to abducting 13 Japanese citizens in the 70s and 80s to help train their spies. Pyongyang called the case closed after returning five people back to Japan and declaring that the eight others were dead. However, Japan has since disputed that and believes even more people were kidnapped. The abductee issue is a very serious human rights issue and something specific to our country. Now in 2014, North Korea says it is launching a new committee to look into the case. And according to the Sankai newspaper, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un will oversee it. We have been informed that North Korea has completed its preparations and is ready to begin. So we think they indeed will do so. Connie Lee, Arirang News. Pyongyang isn't ready to take no for an answer from Seoul. Well, less than two days after South Korea turned down a proposal out of Pyongyang to end all cross-border hostilities, North Korea has reached out again. A piece published Thursday in North Korea's state-run Nodong Shinmun newspaper said Seoul should take Pyongyang's peace offering seriously rather than questioning its motive. North Korea on Monday proposed that both Korea stop slandering each other and suspend all military hostilities. Seoul turned down the offer just one day later, calling it nonsense and insincere. Your gateway to the day's biggest stories in Korea and around the world. Breaking news, the hottest interviews, and a whole lot more. Join Arirang Sean Lim and Kang Chae-ri from the heart of Seoul. News begins now. Primetime News, weeknights, live at 10 on Arirang TV. President Park Geun-hye's plan to reorganize the government following April's ferry disaster that left more than 300 people dead has hit a snag. The goal was to put a bigger emphasis on safety issues, but opposition to these plans has picked up. Kim young reports. President Park Geun-hye has vowed to disband the Korea Coast Guard over its poor handling of rescue operations as the Seoro ferry sank. In its place, the president wants to create a new government body charged with safety and rescue affairs under the office of the prime minister, which would serve as the control tower in future disaster situations. Under the plan, the Coast Guard and the National Emergency Management Agency will be absorbed into a new government agency on national safety. But the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy has already registered its objections to the plan. Instead, it has proposed keeping the Coast Guard and the National Emergency Management Agency intact and establishing a full-fledged safety-related ministry. It also suggested the National Security Council under the presidential office become the control tower of all disaster and safety-related issues instead of the prime minister's office. Under the MPAD plan, the Coast Guard and the National Emergency Management Agency would still be responsible for safety issues, including rescue work at sea and on land. The party is also calling for a removal of the Coast Guard's authority over investigations and intelligence gathering on land. However, the ruling Saenuri party is unlikely to give in to the MPAD's demands. It says the opposition's opinions will be heard, but that more weight must be given to the government's plan. Kim young Arirang News. Korean businessmen's current woes are now down to the local currency, the Korean won, that many expect will breach the psychologically important 1,000 to 1 level against the U.S. dollar later this year. The domestic economy, already suffering from sluggish domestic demand, is expected to take a major hit from this trend. Hwang Jie tells us more. 
This company exports clothing to around 10 countries like the United States and Japan. It receives orders from foreign buyers around five months before it actually ships the products, and the foreign exchange rate is not moving as they expected. Back then, we thought the local currency would be trading at the 1,100 level, but it's about to breach the 1,000 level, and we are taking a massive hit. It's local small and medium-sized exporters like this one that remain vulnerable to the strengthening of the one unlike large companies, which can dodge currency fluctuations by diversifying settlement currencies and raising overseas production. The Korea Federation of Small and Medium Business says that 9 out of 10 small and medium-sized exporters saw their profitability drop in May due to the strong won. The local currency has been continuing its appreciation trend since then. Making matters worse is that the currency woes come at a time when domestic demand remains sluggish, with Korea's economic recovery relying on a gradual export-led process. Experts say the strong one trend is casting clouds on the overall domestic economy. The won is the only currency that's strengthening among major currencies, while the global economy is not picking up pace. So the strong won trend could dent the nation's exports and eventually slow its overall pace of economic recovery. While many agree that the won is undervalued, experts point to the pace of appreciation and say if it strengthens too fast, local exporters won't have time to prepare for the change. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. The curtain went up here in Korea on a theatrical performance dealing with the horrors faced by the Korean victims of Japan's system of wartime sex slavery. The play's Japanese creator says Tokyo cannot have a clear conscience accusing the victims of being liars when there is so much evidence to prove otherwise. With more, here's our Park ji -won. In this monologue play, former wartime sex slave Young Da recounts her life story. When she was young, Korea was under the Japanese colonial rule, and she was sent to Japan thinking she was going to work in a factory. Upon her arrival, however, she was forced into sexual slavery. She was just 14 years old. The play's creator says the piece is titled Liar Young Ja as it accuses the Japanese government of making former sex slaves liars. Through the play, I aim to criticize the Abe administration. As you can see on this stage backdrop, I posted the face of Prime Minister Abe to criticize the administration's recent moves. 80-year-old veteran Japanese playwright Fujita Asaya says he wanted to tell the truth with a play that's written based on facts and research, as he couldn't bear to watch the Japanese government conceal the obvious truth. Despite threats from far-right extremists in Japan, the play was performed in 1995. But Asaya is furious that nothing much changed in almost two decades. It's basically the same as 20 years ago. In fact, the situation in Japan has gotten worse. I'm so angry. I want the Korean people to know that there are many more angry Japanese people like myself. The monodrama will be staged in major cities in Korea this year and will be put on stage in China later this year. Asaya plans to take the show to other countries as well, including the Philippines and Japan, and some European countries in the years to come. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. The body of the Palestinian a teenager found dead in the West Bank has been laid to rest amid growing fears of further violence between Israel and Hamas militants. With more on that story, we now turn to Paul Yi at the News Center. Paul, what were the circumstances behind this teenager's tragic death? Well, officials say 17-year-old Mohammed Abu Qadar was last seen being forced into a car in the occupied West Bank early Wednesday. His body was then discovered later that same day in a forest in Jerusalem. The news triggered violence in East Jerusalem and the West Bank as angry Palestinians threw rocks at Israeli security forces, while militants fired dozens of rockets and mortar shells into Israel. 
The attack came just one day after Israelis buried three teenagers who were believed to have been kidnapped and killed by members of Hamas. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu condemned the death of the Palestinian team as a despicable murder and promised a thorough and swift investigation. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas called on Israel to punish the Israeli settlers he said were being behind the killing. West African health ministers have gathered in Ghana to discuss how to deal with the world's worst outbreak of the Ebola virus. Ebola is highly contagious and it kills up to 90 percent of infected patients with paralyzing fevers. There is no cure and health officials say the current epidemic is showing no signs of slowing. Meeting in Accra, health ministers from Guinea, Sierra Leone and Liberia called on international agencies for much needed medicine and other supplies. But those working on the front lines in the fight against the virus say the biggest challenges have been fear and a lack of understanding, with many infected patients going into hiding. The World Health Organization says the impact of this outbreak has been phenomenal in terms of loss of life and poses greater risk for the social and economic health of the continent. The Ebola by outbreak has so far killed over 400 people since February, making it the largest and deadliest ever. And finally, the United States is beefing up security at overseas airports over concerns of terror bombings as the country prepares to celebrate its Independence Day on July 4th. A U.S. official reportedly said new enhanced security measures would involve additional inspections of passengers and property over the next couple days. They'll be implemented at airports in Europe, Africa and the Middle East, which run direct flights to the states. National security sources say the main concern is that al-Qaeda groups in Syria and Yemen have been working together to develop explosives that would circumvent airport security screenings. Officials are also worried that the recent success of the ISIS militant group in Iraq has attracted fighters from Western countries to the jihadist cause. Those would be operatives with passports who could gain easy access to flights to American cities. And that wraps up our look at international stories making headlines around the world. I'll see you back here tomorrow night. Hello and welcome to Primetime Sports. I'm Stephen Che. Now we start with football. South Korean manager Hong Myung-bo, who had offered to resign for the team's poor showing at the World Cup, is in fact staying on board with the team. Vice President of the Korea Football Association, Ho jung moo announced that Hong's resignation was rejected and that they expected him to fulfill his contract. Ho defended his head coach, saying Hong didn't have enough time only a year to work with the team before World Cup matches. Now his deal runs through the Asian Cup in January next year, meaning he has just about six months to correct the ship and rejuvenate his coaching legacy. And moving on, the Brazil World Cup, with its great performances, is on track to become the highest scoring tournament ever. With 154 goals scored at about 2.8 goals per match, it's on pace to surpass the 171 goals from the 1998 France World Cup. Colombia's James Rodriguez has something to do with it, on top of the individual list with five goals. And looking at the teams, the Netherlands has the most goals with 12, while Germany has connected the most passes with 2,560 at 84 percent accuracy. Meanwhile, Costa Rica, France, Belgium and Colombia are the toughest teams to score on, only having given up a total of two goals each. And heading to the Greens, the British Open, also known as the Open Championship, announced its field of participants on Thursday. And everyone's wondering, how will Tiger do? Well, Tiger Woods will be there and is the favorite, but he'll have to outgolf defending champion Phil Mickelson world number one Adam Scott and a surging Roy McIlroy, among others. Meanwhile, Korea's Choi young Ju or KJ Choi was recently added to the field based on world rankings. And coming home, let's get to Thursday's top KBO matchup. The SK Wyverns took on the NC Dinos at Mazan. Now we go to the first inning, SK's EJ1. He hits two runners home, it's two nothing. Now Scott adds one in the third, as does Im young in the fourth. And this is all before NC answers back with two runs of their own, one coming from Mo Chang-min's bat. 
Then we go to the fifth inning, bases loaded, Lee Ho Jun, Lee Jong Wook. And then we get Son Shi Hyun and Kim Tae Kyun. They all get runners home. It's 8 4 NC. Now, sixth inning, more NC. Mo Chang Min homers with 2 1. And SK adds a couple. But right now, it's NC leading this one 11 7 in the top of the ninth. And looking at the other games, LG defeats Hanwha 5 4. Nexon edges out Lotte 10 9. And Kia beats Tucson 6 3. Well, that's all for now. This has been Stephen Che. I'll see you back here later for more from the world of sports. It has been a drizzly day here in Seoul, but we'll have to get ready for a hot summer day tomorrow. And for more, our Kim Bogyang joins us from the Weather Center. Bogyang, take it away. A heavy rainfall warning remains in effect for parts of Kangono province, and another 10 to 40 millimeters will drop there while we're looking at about 5 to 10 millimeters over in Gyeongsangbuk-do province. Once the showers clear up, hot summer conditions await us tomorrow with daytime highs jumping to the low 30s in Seoul and Daejeon. At the moment, 10 to 20 millimeters per hour of heavy downpours are coming down in the north eastern coastal regions and we're not done with the precipitation just yet as monsoonal fronts should move back up this weekend leading to nationwide rainfall on Monday. On to Friday's readings. Seoul hits 31 while Daegu and Gwangju reach the high 20s. As for other places, Jeju makes it to 26, Dokdo to 22. That'll do it for now, but I'll be back with more after midnight. All right, thanks, Bo Gyeong, for that. And that wraps up this edition of Primetime News. Thanks for being with us tonight. We'll see you soon.